First of all, Lisa, I have f my entire life thought, sh is there a middle name that I can come up with that begins with O, so my initials spelled Joy? You have it in your last name, and you're so lucky. And you emit Joy. And you gave us a very, uh, very interesting movie, maybe not the most joyful movie, but a fascinating movie, thrilling in every way. You've had a really illustrious career. Tell us how you conceived of this. Um, a uh, reminiscence. <laughs> You're yeah. looking up like, what are we talking Wait, about yeah, again? What is, what's back there? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I was uh, unemployed, <laughs> so I had time to think about it. I, I had left my job as a writer on um, a show where I was the only woman for a couple years, and it got very hard to continue working in that situation. Um, so I left and got pregnant and... You know, in that state, and my, my grandfather died around then, I was very much thinking about time and memory and the moments that are very precious to us. Um, and at the same time, having just come off of a very difficult work situation, I was also thinking about the male gaze <laughs> and how limiting it can be on a woman and how much blindness can result from it um, and how much pain. And so... I wanted to do a kind of unorthodox noir where I tried to, in a little way, and I told Hugh about this, he was my co-conspirator. I was like, you know, they're going to think you're the hero because you look like this and you're going to punch people and stuff. But in this film, I want to actually kind of Trojan horse under you being the hero's journey guy, an indictment of the male gaze. <laughs> And and so he was in, which is a great which is a great thing to find a confederate in a movie star who's willing to debunk a little bit of that sort of classic male heroism, you know, and question it and and allow for us to examine our own viewpoints and the blindness that might exist in them. And then um and then I got this other confederate here. That's fascinating because I, I have to confess when I first watched the film I was like oh this is a movie with a very strong sense of a male gaze but then you turn it on its head and it becomes you know far more complicated than what you may think at first and uh, you do a wonderful job of revealing layers and layers of the characters that would not otherwise because it did feel and I think because you have such a strong history of working in a genre that is you know so. Uh, so popular and, and um, so you bring those skills with you. It feels like a, a genre, but then it has so much more depth and intelligence and layers. Oh, thank you. So I like to think that's also because your background, perhaps, do you, do you feel like your, your half Asian background contributes to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, anybody who isn't exactly like the, you know, hegemonic <laughs> order can sometimes feel like, you know, an outsider. And on the one hand, um, that can be painful. You know, like growing up, I, I, I grew up mostly in a very Asian family. Like I spoke Chinese at home. It's very matriarchal. I went to Chinese school on the weekends and all my friends and family were Chinese and we went to the Chinese supermarket. But so, you know, the white kids at school, I didn't look like them or act like them really. Um, but then I also didn't look totally Asian. So there was that idea of um, being an outsider, which I think is really a, a, a beautiful thing when, um, when you sit with it for a while. Because, first of all, everybody feels a bit like an outsider, you know, and it allows you to empathize more with, with other people uh, from other walks of life. But I think it also really informed so much of my writing. You know, I mean, I remember... Um, thinking, I mean, it's it's no coincidence, I guess, that I started by writing about like robots looking at human beings to try to understand their behavior. Because if you're somewhat marginalized, or in the case of you know reminiscence, people are always making suppositions about who you are because their gaze kind of defines and steps upon your own identity. Then you have your only power sometimes, and this is what I felt when I was writing um, in the writers' room before I left was was I didn't have power to complain. I didn't have power to do anything. All I had was the power to silently watch, you know, and learn. And to know that I was an outsider. And one day I would find a way to express what that felt like. And that's where Reminiscence came from. 
fascinating. So I think many of us who are women feel that, many of us who are Asian feel that, and then you get the double whammy, and it's <laughs> extra powers of observation, perhaps, I like to think. So Daniel, hi, Daniel. Hey, Daniel, how are you? <laughs> um, it's so nice. We were reminiscing how we saw each other right before the pandemic. Kind of the last hey. time I was in a public talking situation was with you right yeah. before the pandemic. Yeah, it's And it was right before the pandemic, and we were sharing mics on a stage, and we're like, oh, we think back on that and go, what were we thinking? At least 10 Yeah, it was like, what was that, four days before the lockdown, I think it was. Yeah. So how did you learn of this project? I, I learned of the project from a phone call from Lisa. Um, <laughs> and I, of course, I'd known of her work from Westworld and all that kind of stuff. And so when she called, I was really excited to hear about it. And she just basically explained the character to me. And I hadn't seen the script yet. And just the way she explained the character to me, I was like, OK, I'm in. I'm how, did in. She dis how did she explain it to you? Well, um, first of all, like after Into the Badlands, I'd taken probably like eight or nine months off to kind of reassess what I wanted to do next. And, you know, I got a lot of martial arts offers. And I, I realized that if I took another martial arts thing right after Into the Badlands, that's all I'd be doing for the rest of my life, probably. Um, I think the interesting thing is in my career in the United States has been relatively young, but I did 20 years in Hong Kong and Asia. And what pe most people know me from here is Into the Badlands. So then you get put into a box right away. Oh, he's Asian and he knows martial arts, so he's a martial arts guy, when in fact, or 65 films in Asia, I think I only did two martial arts things my whole career. And so I was looking for something that, that was able to express something else besides that. That's one side of me, but there's more to me than that. And so um, I was looking for a character with substance with something interesting and something I've never done, really done before. And Lisa calls me and tells me about this character. And she goes, you know, I know it's, it's a villain character and he's a gangster, which may seem kind of stereotypical because you're Asian, but I have an agenda with him. I want him to be like, you know, dark and evil and bad guy and all that stuff. But I want him to be extremely like sexy and attractive and seductive as well. And I, I was I under, immediately understand what she was talking about because as fellow Asian Americans, we both understand without even having to talk about it that Asian American males have often been emasculated on screen in America, right? And so when she started saying that, I knew immediately what she was trying to un, undo. And I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in. Like, it was a long conversation, it was like 45 minutes or something. But I, I immediately agreed to do it. And then when I saw the script, that was an extra bonus because then it was this beautiful, intelligent, extremely layered script with this really cool character jammed in the middle of it. So I was like, very, very happy. Excellent. So what, was there uh, anything in particular that you want to say about when you were making this movie, about how you brought up the character? Did anything change along the way? You talked a little bit earlier about speaking Chinese. Was that always your intention, that you would speak sometimes in Chinese? Uh, yeah, I'm, well, when I initially wrote the character, um, I, I only, you know, I don't know how to do a lot of slang, so mm -hmm. I just used how I speak at home, <laughs> which is this kind of Chinglish, and I was like, maybe that will sound kind of gangster. Um, and so <laughs> that's, that's how that came about. Uh, it just seemed... Uh, I could just hear it more easily than presuming to, to know some other kind of dialect. Um, and I also thought it would be really interesting in a world that is globalizing, especially in that Miami, to show that the Chinese language had become integrated, even in its slang in, in English. We've seen it done with Spanish, but you know, not yet Chinese as much. And uh, it, was, it was fun because we talked about... Um, and not getting the pronunciation totally right, you know, not not doing all the tones correctly. Um, Daniel taught me <laughs> how to write more convincing curses. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think I, sure I think um, you know, having spent twenty years in Asia, I picked up on a lot of slang. And so when I saw her uh, Chinese writing, I was like, oh, this is this this is not nice. It's cute. <laughs> but I was like, can we make this a little more gangster? Like, like for example, I think. I, I use new, which is which is um, like chick, my chick, right? And I think she wrote new hi, my girl, which is very polite, right? But I was like, I think Saint Joe is not necessarily at that polite. So can we like twist these a little bit to be more like, um, like what a dude would say? And so, so that was fun. It was fun because she didn't know any of these new slang things. These are like they don't teach you that in Chinese your, school. Yeah, your, and your mom wouldn't teach you that <laughs> not either. Not right? Saturday morning Chinese school. I don't anymore. even think my parents know some of those those words either. Well, it's you know? contemporary. Yeah, it's yeah. very contemporary. So you know, then having spent all that time there in Asia, you realize like how nuanced the language is. Like Cantonese, Mandarin, are also 
very, very nuanced. And so to be able to throw in some of those things, it was fun. It was cool. It was really fun. And well, did you know? I don't know if you knew this, but when I wrote that character initially, it was race blind. I didn't. I wasn't set necessarily. But he was still going to speak Chinese. Ch yeah, oh, interesting. I wanted oh, cool. it to be just a part of the culture, right. you know. And right. I, I was just writing to to show that that had happened, you know. Um, and then as I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, like, it, like, you could just have a Chinese person do it too. <laughs> and then when I thought of you, that's when I thought, oh, it's not only going to be better with somebody who's actually Chinese and show the Chinese American experience, but I also wanted then and had the opportunity because you're such a versatile actor. I was like, you know, I want him to be badass and sexy and kind of dangerous. But then at the end, I feel such sympathy for your character. You know, I feel, you know, we were able to then talk about some of American history in, in the guise mm. of science fiction and talk about, you know, being interned and and kind of put it in a new light. You know, we look back on the internment and it feels, oh, so far, so long ago, mm. you know, but it, it's it, I wanted to recontextualize it and put it here and say it doesn't take that much for history to repeat itself and and to have somebody not like in a black and white photo looking like you know oh they were interned and that was so long ago but to have Daniel Wu speaking with a southern accent <laughs> talking about how he was also an American and that happened to him to me it was um, too powerful to to deny but yeah and this is all before all the Asian hate crime stuff started appearing and all that so. You know, when that started happening, I started thinking about the movie and what we'd done in the movie. I was like, wow, we kind of, you know, we kind of hit these topics yeah. before really right knowing about head. it. Yeah. yeah. And that is the power. I mean, because you're a writer and a director, so nobody's going to screw around. I was going to say the dirty word, but nobody's going to screw around with your, with your vision. And that's what makes it so powerful. You can bring those authentic elements into it. And, you know, that's why we well, need the, more. That was the one interesting thing about working on this film. I worked on like 70 movies or whatever. And, you know, I've worked with many Chinese directors, Hong Kong directors, many American directors, but I've never worked with a Chinese American director, right? So there was this kind of shared um, feeling I had with her that felt like I was working with a sister because there's these things that we, like, like, like what I was inferring from the, the conversation we had about the character, I knew what she was talking about because, you know, only someone like her would understand what someone like me has gone through, you know, in my career and all that kind of stuff. And so um, there was a lot of, like, you know, short form language that we could we could we could really chit chat about and really kind of connect with and bond with on that level. And it, there's like a safety too. You know, like w as a director, when I was working with him, I was like, my brother's not going to be like a pain in the ass or some kind of diva in this scene. Right. We're just going to do the best scene possible. And it also, when we were discussing your costume and the lack thereof of like a shirt and all that stuff, when uh, dealing with a different actor. I think I would have been much less forthright in it, you know? But with you, I was like, you know we have a problem, and you know you have great apps, so let's <laughs> take that thing off and try to fix this. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, things like that, you know, I, I, I got what she was doing. And then, you know, for example, I was on, I was on a photo shoot the other day. With, it was for a car photo shoot, and they wanted, the, the, the photographer is a, wh a white guy. He's like, so yeah, can you do like some martial arts poses in front of the car? I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not really going to do that because, you know, they don't see that as, you know, a microaggression, but it actually is because they're trying to put you in this box, right? Yes. It's, and it's, so, it's so working with someone like Lisa is like you can fully trust her because she's not going to attempt to do anything like that to kind of exploit you or put you in that box, you know? Because she's as sensitive as you are yeah. to the stereotypes. That yeah. We're so when she told me against. not to wear the shirt, I was like, okay, <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> it's kind of a win-win in that situation. Right. <laughs> but that, that is also, you know, what, despite a lot of the tragic events that have been going on, what I find so gratifying these days, it is possible to have filmmakers and actors who are bringing some of that culture, you know, the Asian culture into works that are very relatable and really to have Chinese sprinkled in. I mean, I, it really up until I think the last year, every time someone was speaking Chinese in a movie, I was like, ah. you know, yeah. her. like it uh, really hurt yeah. because they, they just clearly didn't know what they were doing and it was painful. And so I'm so glad, you know, that in this movie and, and in just a few others, like I just saw Shang-Chi mm -hmm. or whatever. So now people are taking it more seriously. That's just a one tiny step towards. Yeah, I mean, the know, past few years have been really, really interesting. The change has happened where it was just stilted for so long. I mean, 
you know, as a producer of Joy Luck Club, this is an example. I left uh, for Hong Kong two years after Joy Luck Club came out. I came back a year before Crazy Rich Asians came out. Maybe there was like a handful of Asian American films in between in 20 something years. And then me personally, I did 65 movies in that span, right? And so it was a sad thing that in all that time, nothing really changed for us. But then the past few years has been an immense we're amount of so change. We're so glad you're yeah. back. So it's exciting, so much, yeah. It's a great time. I think more and more people should be coming back now because now there is like a plethora of great movies and TV shows and we have to keep keep it going. Exactly. So the two of you have definitely contributed heartily. No, that's, I mean, that's a big part of the reason why I'm back here is because I realized the potential of you know, influencing people and changing things. And, you know, probably 10 years before, there wasn't that opportunity, so I didn't even bother trying to come back here. And a lot of people were like, well, why are you giving up a career in Asia where, you know, you can make so much more money and you're a bigger star and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, I really want to change something for the next generation. I want my daughter to be able to see, you know, more Asian Americans on screen and make it, and make them, you know, when I did Badlands, a bunch of kids came up to me, and Asian kids, and they're like, oh, I want to be like Sunny, you know, they want to be like that character. And it was like a... A very interesting thing because I didn't have that growing up. I didn't have anybody Asian American on screen that I could I could look up to. I had Long Duck Dong. That was it, right. you know. And 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 so when I realized the importance of that, was, I made it a, a a serious choice to stay here and be here for the next you know rest of my career. So you're here to stay. Yeah, I mean I'm going like back and forth, <laughs> but but yeah. That's good. I want to know that. Um, I think we probably need to open it up for questions right now. I have no idea what time it is. They told me we have 20 <laughs> minutes. Is it is now the right time? Okay. I see a hand over there. Hi, good evening. Um, the score was beautiful, and I'm a huge fan of Frank work. And I just wanted to know what was your collaboration with like, Tim working for you to do the music and what you talked to him about before, during the filming, <coughs> during the shooting? Yeah. I mean, I, I adore Ramin. So the second I was even thinking about um, doing this film before I'd sold it even. I was meeting with Ramin and talking to him. I'd found all these tapes, all these recordings of old tapes that played again and again and again until the silver filament ran off of them and the sound became distorted. And I was playing them for poor Ramin and I was like, this is like how memory works, right? It, it erodes over time and, and it becomes a different kind of sound. But what if it didn't? And then we were talking about how it would be really nice to work with motifs in the music in which because this is a film about seeing people, right, about seeing beyond the obvious or beyond the stereotype, um, I thought, you know, if each character has a theme, but they're very simple at first, and then we grow them as our understanding and complexity of them grows throughout the film, and in the end, the songs will kind of merge into one final piece. I was like, we can kind of recapitulate the shape of the, uh, of the character arcs as well. And so, you know, all of that started early. The idea that I wanted a, a very swaggery tone to, to do a new kind of not saxophone-based noir soundtrack. So he brought in, he got very excited. He brought in all his guitars because I thought guitar would be nice. And Ramin is a great guitar player. And he down-tuned the lowest bass guitar he had. So it's literally the lowest note that a guitar can play. And that forms a lot of the musical bass for it. Anybody else? I see a hand in the back. Yes. Is there a mic? Oh, thank you. Um, um, thank you so much for bringing this movie to us. I this is my first uh, movie experience after the pandemic since the pandemic. So this is like immensely. Thank you for coming out. Oh, thank you, thank you. This is also. Um, Listening to you talk about how you know you're turning the um, original, you know, the uh, male gaze into. I was in the first half. I was just as Janet was talking about. You know, I was thinking this is like a traditional male gaze. I was like looking comfortable, and then after layers and layers of review, I was like, this is great. It's so timely. Um, so, and um, I was also very surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear um, Chinese, um, you know, Chinese in the in in, in the um, dialogue. And as a Chinese um, female screenwriter, I'm immensely inspired by this. I was gonna ask what was the choice about, you know, putting Chinese in the dialogue, but obviously you have already covered that. <laughs> so, you know, as a screenwriter, what I'm really wondering is, have you ever experienced any pushback during the development of the script? Because obviously you're a director, so you have, you know, more um, power over, you know, your choices. 
but I would imagine that you still experience pushbacks when you were, you know, telling the script to others. So I just wonder yeah. if there's any story that you can I share. mean, for sure, I experienced pushback. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think anybody trying to sell an original film nowadays experiences significant pushback. It's very difficult. And then to do a film that doesn't fit tidily into one specific genre, very challenging. Um, to do it as a first time female minority director is also challenging, especially when it's not the kind of film that they were expecting I would make. You know, I was pregnant and ginormous and waddling around with a script about people shooting each other and running around like blinded by love and lust and and it was kind of shocking to see coming from this very sweaty pregnant lady. Um, <laughs> and so they kept pitching me like romances and, and I was like, I don't want to write a romance. I want to write this story about what it feels like um, in the desire phase of something from both sides. You know, the way that you can feel obsessed and alive and you know, just just completely enamored and how quickly that can change to something else if you feel rejected. And on the other hand, I want to write about what it feels like to have the gaze of somebody upon you and want to be, you know, great for them, to want them to want you and to know that they like you in a certain way, especially as a woman, and that if, you know, you can be smart but not smarter than them, sexy but not slutty, you know, pretty but not too timid. You know, it's just, it's, there's so many different, different roles you have to play. And it's also, it's different for culture too, right? Like for Chinese culture, for American culture, it's, it's always different. But especially if you're a woman, you're always so aware of the millions of micro judgments that are being leveled against you. And if you're an Asian woman or if you're an Asian man, you get the same thing. You know you never walk into a room without having, it's like arrows, do you know what I mean? Just slinging at you and putting you in as many boxes as possible. And then when other people get to just go about their day and be who they are, you have to kind of push your way out of all of these boxes that surround you. And it's exhausting and it makes doing anything so much harder because by the time you've gotten just the you know, range of motion that a regular white dude gets by just waking up in the morning, <laughs> you've been fighting for like seven years, you know? And so, you know, the, the, the thing is, is I, I didn't want to make the stories they wanted me to make, and I, I still don't, and it's, it's harder, you know? Um, um, but I got really lucky because I have the best cast, the best crew, and Warner Brothers has been so supportive. You know, I think sometimes if you are, um, an outsider in any way, it's good to, you know, I sold both the script and later um, attached myself as director and sold the film itself in two um, um, competitive bidding situations. I never went with just one buyer because I knew that if I did, um, the pressure to change things and make them kind of easier and more palatable would be something I would not be able to fight. I would have no leverage. Um, so that's why I, I took the path that I did. But no, man, it's not easy. <laughs> but it's fun, because by the time you get there, the people who have stayed with you and want to do it with you, they are so invested, and they are so awesome. And you know that you all see the same thing and believe in it. And it's, and it's I wouldn't trade that for the world. I have to say, one of the amazing things of being on set and watching her work was just her full command of, like, not just the creative side, but leading this team. And you know, there's a lot of familiarity from, from Westworld and all that, but you could see that everyone believed in her, right? And I, I just remember sitting, I don't know if you ever saw this, but I was sitting, always sitting on the side watching you because I was in, it was in so much awe because it was so awesome to see a fellow sister like command that power. And it was just cool to see. I've never seen it before in my 20 something years of working in this business. And I was just like, this is cool. This is so cool. Yeah. At what stage did you sell it? Did you, you had a script, mm -hmm. you said you were gonna direct it, did you have to package it first? Did you have Oh, to no, I, um, so, it, gosh, it, it took so long, you guys, it, it took a long time. So I, I, it didn't take a long time to write. I started writing in my first trimester of my pregnancy, and then I finished the script by the end of the second trimester, and then I sold it in the third. That's literally my timeline for it. I just remember when I was puking, and then when I was fat. Like, it's, it goes like that. Um, and then I sold it uh, to Legendary, in a competitive situation, th they 
but I attached myself as a producer so I could veto whoever I wanted, but they could also veto me. So I, I liked director Park wanted to do it, who did um, oh. Oh Boy, and I thought he was great. Yeah. And, um, but they wanted uh, more, you know, American commercially established directors. And so we just kept vetoing each other <laughs> forever. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that was also one of those cases where they did want it to have a more traditional ending. They wanted the girl to be much more soft and pliant and loving and easier to love, you know, not as not as many secrets and whatever, just a little easier. And and I was like, well, you know, this is about something else. It's about how it's not always easy to love all of everyone. You know, you have to kind of work at it and the working at it is what makes it love. Um, so yeah, there were some there were some disagreements in that, um, and then it just kind of rested for a while. I just kind of ignored it, um, and then one day I just I don't know why I was like uh, somebody else wanted to direct it, and I was like, you know what, I'll just direct it because I, I feel like I'll I'll just get it, I'll do it then, um, and so uh, I just wrote to Hugh Jackman, I wrote him an email like a fan letter. Um, like for real, it was a fan letter, um, and I got his email from my agents. You know, it's my my family had worked with him before a long time ago, but I didn't want to go through that route. So I like creepily called my agents, asked for his email, sent him this weird email asking if I could stop by and tell him about the story, refused to send him the script in some weird asshole move, <laughs> and then because um, I wanted him to see the visuals that I had planned out. And then um, I kind of pretended I was in the neighborhood, but I was actually in L.A., and he was in New York. And so when he said he would meet me, I had to, like, book a red eye, like, jump in a cab, go down there, and, like, pretend to be casually just in the neighborhood. Um, it was all super uncool. But, um, but uh, it, it got him attached. And so we, we together, and then later Rebecca came on board, and with that package, uh, I took it to Berlin, and that's where it sold. Yeah, never easy, never easy. <laughs> but you, you jumped on that plane, great. Um, and, and people must have known your work, even though you hadn't direct before. I mean, you've done such incredible things, so that helped. And you have a couple of 800-pound gorillas sort of supporting you, hopefully, or were they not involved, your, your husband or? Oh, no, no, I can't they, involve they, them. I mean, with Chris and I, it's like kind of church and state because he's my... He's my brother-in-law, you know, and like I don't want it to be weird. And I'm already gonna get by virtue of the fact that I married Jonah, like all these Nolan comparisons, which I don't talk to Chris about film. He never watched my film until the premiere. He's never read the script. He has no idea what I'm doing, um, you know. And I don't have any idea what he's doing until I see the film. I love his films. Um, we have a shared um, love of genre. You know, I feel like my films have more sex, um, <laughs> for one. Um, Me too. Yeah, his films have more budget, and my <laughs> films have more sex. So that's that's the difference. Um, but I but have a few things to learn from you. Yeah, I mean that's the other thing, right? Like being being married to another screenwriter, especially when Westworld started. It was very much like, why'd you bring your wife and give her a credit? You know, it was tough. They didn't want. You know, it was tough. And so I've always been, especially with this film, very sensitive to distance myself Fiercely from Fiercely independent, it sounds like. Yeah, like although, you, you know, Jonah produced it, but he, I was, he just knows. He's like, I shouldn't go on set with her. And he's a great producer, but, but uh, yeah, we, we try to, I try to keep it separate. And you going to direct some more? If, if you had the chance? She better. She better. <laughs> we hope. We I'm hope. counting on it. There, there really is such a dearth of women directors. I mean, it's pathetic. Yes, I, I would love to direct again, but, but uh, yeah, you can't just direct Hopefully this fan fiction for yourself. Isn't, this isn't, we're not being too terrifying tonight, I hope. No, I mean, this is like, I always like um, uh, talking with people who, who are, you know, in, involved in Asian culture or society or who are Asian. I just feel, frankly, more at home, you know. Um, and we're lucky that we have a community now. You know, and so anyway, sorry. Uh, any other questions? I, I cannot. There's two. Keep track there's of two there. Is one. I think you were first. The, with the with, white shirt. Yeah. With the with the blue mask. Doesn't everybody have a blue mask? 
I'm black. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'm a huge fan for Westworld. I'm fascinated by sci-fi, by memory, and by time. And to merge all of these together, I think you've done an amazing job to make this film. And I applaud your courage to make this film. Um, I'm a writer-director. I am um, 33 years old. And you know, by starting out my first few projects, I, I, wa I want to make a comment about the male gaze. Because when I first started out uh, my few projects, you know, I can only picture my protagonist to be a white man. And I objectify women. <laughs> Looking back, you know, those were male gaze. But now, um, I think it was really interesting to see that, you know, this film, I think it started out, maybe uh, we look at um, the, the, uh, the women in this film with male gaze, but I think slowly we give voice back to women and to establish the idea of a female gaze. And I thought it was really interesting. And um, I was wondering what was your process um, to when you were writing, or is this something that you discover along the way? I was very curious about your process. In, in terms of the, the male gaze element of it? Yes. I mean, that was, for me, <clears throat> um, you know, there's a romantic side to me, for sure, you know, with, and memory I find incredibly compelling and romantic, and I can be very idealistic and earnest about stuff. I think we live in a cynical time, and I've always been pretty idealistic, even if I get knocked down a bit for it, you know, um, just because I think it, it's a better world if you can, if you can not be too cynical. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I had experienced some really hard stuff uh, in terms of, um, you know, I wasn't staying in my lane, you know, I wanted to do action. I wanted to write female characters who weren't traditionally likable. Um, I wanted to write men who could show vulnerability. I, I, it made people upset. Um, and I wanted to do things with scope. And they wanted me to do smaller things, you know, and, and you know, more intimate, emotionally safe things. And I didn't, I didn't want to do any of that because uh, I, I just, it's just not where my interests lie. It's not that I don't think those things are cool. Um, and so I think between that and the idea that everybody had these ideas of where I should be, and then the pretty bad sexual harassment and treatment um, that go along when you're like the only woman in a company for a long time, uh, you know, for me, writing is always my way of working through stuff, you know? Uh, I finally left my job because I was like, I can't stay here because I will become so jaded. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I chose unemployment. And, and while I was sitting there stewing and wondering what had become of my life and my career, and also throwing up because I'd gotten pregnant, which was awesome. Um, uh, but um, I realized that I wanted to make the kind of films that those guys were allowed to make. And the only way I could do it was, you know, to make it look ostensibly like that film and then to do what I really wanted to do, which was to smuggle in this other thing, which is, you know, throughout the film, it's explicitly called out. <laughs> Watts talks about it, um, and Rebecca's character talks about it. They talk about how, you know, he only sees this or that, and you're, you're just chasing an idea of someone. <laughs> you know, it's explicitly called out. Um, it's, not, it's not subtext for me, even though it's funny because that's so the trope of, of, of noir that even if I explicitly say it, it goes over people's heads sometimes. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, like, I'm sitting there telling you like on many, many occasions in this, like Easter eggs, right? Like, like there's something going on here. It's like, why were you crying? She says she was pretending. You know, and it's like, you know, you see her dressed in regular clothes and they're nothing like this crazy red dress that she wore on the first date. You know, it's all, she's playing with the idea of what she should be, 
right? And using it as a weapon to get what she needed in that moment. So it is a kind of ride where you have to go through it in order to debunk it. You know, same with Westworld. Like I, I, you know, I worked in the family violence group at the DA's office, and I was horrified by all the, you know, sexual violence cases I was prosecuting. And, you know, I guess I could write a story about like a really sad woman and the tragedy that befell her, or about like a, you know, a woman who triumphed over it. Like those stories are great. But I wanted to write a story about a robot who was a symbol for a lot of women who awakened to the difficult situation of her life and decided to overthrow it. That's how I wanted to deal with my feelings. <laughs> okay, one other, one other question. I think we probably have time for one more. Thank you. So this is a great film, and um, I come from a background of speaking Chinese. And I'm going back to this topic again of how you guys are putting um, Chinese into this film unapologetically. Um, so it's a question for both Lisa and Daniel. What were you thinking when you create this character of Daniel? Like, who were you thinking? And is there any inspiration from any Asian films or Chinese films before um, that? inspire you to do this sexy man that speaks um, <laughs> Chinese when he is throwing out those uh, gang slang. Yeah. And answer it in Chinglish. You should know, don't want Do it. Do it in character. The only other layer I added to your layer was the, the accent thing. Yeah, that was so good. Just because I thought it'd be cool to juxtapose um, that Chinese with like a very American way of speaking. And so, um, and also just because I, I worked in New Orleans and I heard that accent so much and I really liked it. It just sounds cool. And I'm, oh, I'm, always, and I'm always thrown back by when I meet an Asian person that's grown up in the South and they have a Southern accent. I'm working on a documentary now that just follows like a, a Chinese family that stores in Georgia since the 1920s. So this guy's like 80 years old and he speaks like a Southern gentleman. It's just really trippy because he looks like my, grand, my father, but he speaks with this like real Southern charm accent. And so I think that I wanted to add that layer to it just because I thought that would make it more memorable and juxtapose the Chinese even more. I think your role was the scariest one in so many ways because it's a gonzo role. It could have gone off the rails in 30,000 different directions. Yeah, yeah, no, totally, totally. It was a tough one. And I remember like being like, and we were talking, he's like, and I'm gonna do a Southern accent. I was like, I remember asking okay. you, is that, is that cool? <laughs> Okay, can you do one? Is that good? Okay, let's do it. And then uh, he showed up, and it was just absolutely magnetic. No one could take their eyes off. I, I, I wasn't sure it was going to work until we shot. Yeah. And when we, that first day we shot, I was like, okay, this is working. Right. Oh, yeah. I was just like, watching gosh. Hugh's reaction, watching everyone else's reaction, I was like, okay, this is working, this is good. Because it, it is. But I also, I also needed your permission to let me go, Gonzo, and do that, because I often don't get that permission. No, so getting that permission was, was great and with someone that you totally trust and you know is going to shape it well for you so you don't go too off the rails and go way out there. Um, so it was fun. It made it really a lot of fun. I mean, yeah, it was scary a little bit, but, but I think those are the most fun roles when you take that risk. Yeah, and, you, and I think I love the character. You know, I mean, I just want to watch St. Joe all day. I want the backstory of St. Joe. I want St. Joe to survive. Yeah, so it's a prequel. St. Joe. St. Joe's prequel. Um, but the other thing, so here's the thing. You're... You're, to me, you're just a, a leading man. You know, you're not an Asian American leading man. You are that too, you know? You're just a leading man. Like, I always look at voice too, for when I, when I look at actors, I think voice is so important um, because if you look at all your favorite actors, there's something distinctive about their voice and likely their face, right? They're never perfectly beautiful, although you were, you were very close. <laughs> um, um, they give you that little edge, that little something that sticks with you and makes them more beautiful, more captivating to the screen. And one of the things that I also love about Daniel, whatever accent you're doing, you have that voice that I think is really important as an actor's tool. And it was fucking crazy to watch him speak with this other night. It was crazy. That was crazy. Oh, and your hair. We did your oh, hair. Right, right, right. The pump of you. Yeah, yes. the whole thing, the whole yeah. face, yeah. the facial hair. No, there was there was a whole facial hair all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I was like, I was like, okay, we're gonna go for a dirty hot look. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Wow. Well, thank you both so much. Lisa, I hope you make many, many more films. It's, it's great to see you behind the, the camera in the director's chair. And you bring a, a very unique voice and vision. And we need it, and we want it. And Daniel, you have blessed us for so many years, and we're so glad you're here. Right? Stateside. And this, this great world's coming for you. I have a few. Yeah. Um, so, well, thank you all for coming. And, uh,